Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Dr. Psych Mom Show. I think this is my 10th episode, which is great since I just started this a week ago, but I uh, do everything at uh, full steam ahead, and these are only 20 minutes with no guests, so let's not get that excited about that achievement. Anyway, I'm enjoying doing it, and I hope everybody's enjoying listening as well. So today, what I was going to talk about is one of my favorite topics, responsive desire. So what responsive desire means is that, um, well, okay, let's, let's first start with spontaneous desire. Spontaneous desire is when somebody feels turned on and wants to have sex before having sex. Just by looking at somebody or thinking about something, they feel turned on. If you're, you feel physiologically aroused, you feel mentally aroused, you want to have sex. Okay, cool. Everybody knows what that is. Responsive desire is something that most people do not know about, and it is the opposite. It is desire that happens in response to touching or to stimulation or to starting to have sex in general. So, unfortunately, men, unfortunately for people in heterosexual relationships, men and women frequently have different forms of desire within monogamy. Now, within monogamy is key. Within a long-term relationship, once you're out of the honeymoon phase, which usually lasts about 18 months to two years, the woman's sex drive will drop and the man's sex drive still keeps chugging along. Maybe he's not as into it as he was at the very beginning, but it's really a small decrease compared to the woman, which just drops down really quick. And so what happens is at the beginning of the relationship, the woman and the man both had spontaneous desire they would look at each other and want to have sex, especially if they had similar libidos. Then, once monogamy sets in and the honeymoon stage is over, the woman's desire switches to responsive. So this means that she will need to start touching in order to get aroused. But if she doesn't know this, and she and the man doesn't know it, and they're both waiting for her spontaneous desire to kick in, then they are going to be you know, fucked, because this is not a good situation. The woman is going to think that she is no longer into him, into the man, because she is not as attracted to him immediately and doesn't think about sex when he walks in the room. And the man is going to sometimes, in a worst-case scenario, feel like there's a bait and switch. She acted like she was into sex before, but now that we're really together, she's not. Now, I am here to tell you this is not a bait and switch. I have never heard of a woman, at least in the current generation of women that I work with, maybe this is something done a long time ago when women had to get married in order to have any sort of a a life at all or money or freedom or anything. But nowadays, women do not try to to trap men with sex or they, they don't try to act different about sex before marriage than they do after marriage. This isn't anything conscious. This isn't um, uh, a thing that a woman has done in order to be malevolent in some way. She's waiting for her spontaneous desire to kick in also, but it doesn't after the honeymoon phase. At that point, she transforms to responsive desire, which means that it takes her a while to warm up, and only after starting to have sex does she really want sex, unless sometimes when she's ovulating. Then she thinks about sex before and thinks that would be nice to have sex, but usually she doesn't. With the same old guy, monogamy, she does not feel spontaneous desire almost ever. This has absolutely no bearing on whether she's going to enjoy sex at all when she has it. So that is where couples get into trouble too. The first is assuming that the woman's going to have spontaneous desire forever the way the man does and that the lack thereof is um, indicates something terrible about her feelings about him. And the second one is that women then Since they feel like that, they feel like they should not have sex when they're not in the mood. And then guess what happens? How often do you think that a woman with responsive desire has sex when she's waiting to get into the mood before sex? Well, the answer is zero. Never. She never will have sex if she's waiting to be in the mood before she has sex. So what does this look like? This looks like a couple where... The woman is mad at something, 
just because, you know, you get mad at something. You're in a monogamous relationship. He isn't being as nice as he used to be. He hasn't gotten her flowers in a while. He is not a, the disciplinarian that she wishes that he was. Whatever it is. Anyway, so she takes these things. By the way, he's irritated about stuff with her also, obviously. Um, should be obvious for anybody that's been in a relationship that the annoyance goes both ways. Anyway, so... The annoyance goes both ways, but the sex drive doesn't go both ways. So he's annoyed that she's, um, you know, OCD about the dishes, dishwasher, let's say. Colloquial OCD there, or clinical OCD, depends on the couple. And, uh, but he still wants to have sex with her. He still looks at her and thinks, I want to have sex with her. Fine. She looks at him, you know, being slothful or messy or arrogant or, you know, whatever. Whatever she thinks about him that is less than wonderful. And she thinks, and that's why I don't want to have sex with him. Then they go into couples counseling. They work all on him being messy or slovenly or arrogant or whatever. I mean, great. That's cool. Everybody needs some self-work. But unless we discuss the physiology and the biology of responsive desire within monogamy and women... We are, if we try to make him so perfect that she again experiences spontaneous desire, then we are barking up the wrong tree. This is never going to happen. And when it doesn't happen, she may conclude she's in the wrong relationship. Unfortunately, the same pattern is going to happen in the next relationship and every relationship thereafter for the majority of women that experience responsive desire. Now, there are very high libido women that still look at, I mean, I don't really meet them, but I mean, I'm just trying to be, you know, not, I'm trying to, to say that there's all kinds of people in the world and that some of them must include women that go around 24 seven thinking about sex with their husbands. I mean, this really, I can't, I can't imagine that. I mean, but then again, you know, there's all kinds of people. I haven't met all of them. The majority of the women that I know, either friends or clients or even novel characters, I mean like anybody that's a female, I also of course am a female, within an intimate relationship your sex drive goes down, but if you're still attracted to your partner and you start to have sex with them, look what happens, you can still have wonderful, fulfilling sex that you deeply enjoy, even though two minutes before you weren't thinking about sex at all. Now, if you understand responsive desire and that you're not expected as a woman to have spontaneous desire anymore within monogamy, then you can try to set yourself up for success. So you can start to say, I'm going to have sex, let's say, uh, every, you know, every morning. Let's say you want to try to have sex every morning or every other morning to leave space to get turned on, and to enjoy yourself, you're going to mentally say every morning, and I say morning because most women hate night, so this is another big problem that I'll do a podcast about. Women's testosterone is, everybody's testosterone is lowest at night, but for men, they have testosterone to spare. Women, especially as you age, we don't have testosterone to spare, so you're really feeling like super not sexy at night usually. Of course, some women also say in the morning they feel not sexy because they're thinking about getting up, getting moving, whatever. A lot of women like the afternoon. But this hypothetical woman that I'm saying that just listened to my podcast and had a eureka moment about responsive desire and wants to be a good partner and really bring her A-game to the relationship, let's say she says every morning, you know, sometimes the kids come into the room, sometimes you're sick, whatever, but... As a default, I am going to turn over and start kissing my husband or he's going to turn over and I'm going to tell him that the mornings are back in play. Probably haven't been on the table for like 15 years, but what the hell? I listened to this awesome podcast and now they're back in play. So in the morning, I am going to make mental space for the idea that I could get turned on. So we're going to start kissing and touching, etc. And I'm going to see. I'm going to see if I get in the mood. You know what? If your marriage is okay or great, not if it's terrible. If it's terrible, you need to work on it, certainly. Um, But if it isn't terrible and you're still attracted physically to your spouse, even at all, 
even to the point that hypothetically you could see how somebody else wouldn't kick them out of bed, no, not a high bar, if you're even remotely attracted to your spouse and you start kissing them and touching them, then you're, you just kick on. It's like the switch flips for women with responsive desire. It may take five minutes, may take 10 minutes, may take 20 minutes. This is why I'm a fan of longer encounters. When people tell me that they have these very short sexual encounters, a woman hasn't decided for the first 10 minutes whether she's even into this. If the whole encounter lasts 10 minutes, she, 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 she cannot possibly have enjoyed herself, most women. There are some other women that really like quickies, and these are women with a more sexual um, erotic blueprint. So there's five erotic blueprints, one of them sexual. Those are the people that are just turned on by uh, penetration. God bless them. I mean, that's real easy. But for the majority of women who have other erotic blueprints, you can just Google erotic blueprint, and I also have posts about it on Dr. Psych Mom. Um, but anyway, for people who have, for example, a sensual erotic blueprint that like massage and touch and words and whispering and a nice setup and the room to be nice and all of these sorts of sensual things, 10 minutes, 10 minutes you're still in the very, very early stages of what could end up being a good sexual encounter if it doesn't end prematurely. So anyhow, so if you really want to explore whether erotic, erotic, responsive desire works for you, then you have to get yourself into the headspace where you're going to try. You can't say, no, no, I know when I'm in the mood and when I'm not. I look at my husband, I feel nothing. Well, you know, you, you look at probably a hot guy on the street and you feel nothing. If you're a woman in your, like, after your 20s, like, you know, unless you're ovulating. You're stressed out. You got your kids to think about. You got your job to think about. Like, I mean, most women aren't really going around thinking about sex that much. If you are, you don't need to listen to my podcast. Then this is wonderful. You are a wonderful, rare unicorn. And you should tell your husband that I said that he's a super lucky man. But for the women that go around all day, do not really think about sex. Don't let that make you think that you cannot have a good sexual experience still. A very good sexual experience. As good as you used to when you felt spontaneous desire. It's not going to be the same. I mean, you know the person. There's not that same excitement of, oh my God, are we going to be boyfriend, girlfriend, or you know, whatever you think in your 20s. But it's not going to be like that. But it can be even better physically because you've gotten to know what each other likes and doesn't like, and you feel closer. There's that deep attachment bond. So if you really think that you may have misjudged your spontaneous desire versus responsive desire whole rigmarole that I'm describing, and you want to test it, then you have to get yourself in the headspace to test it even when you're looking at your husband and you're like, nah, I don't care. I'm not thinking about sex. You're not alone. That's how most women feel. Even if your husband looks handsome, that's the interesting part. I have all these women in couples counseling that are like, oh, yeah, my husband, he's a good-looking guy. Yeah, sure, he's good shape. I like him. He's a good-looking guy, handsome. Do you want to have sex with him? No, I don't want to have sex with him at all. Is he bad in bed? No, he's good in bed. When we have sex, these, they say, I like it. But I just really don't think about it. I'm not in the mood, and I don't think about sex. Don't want to have sex with him at all. But these women do not know, of course, I tell them, they're my clients, I, about responsive desire. They think that because they don't look at their husband and want to have sex with him right then, that that means that there is no attraction anymore. They could admire that he is handsome. They could, they're not blind. They see that he's good looking, but it does nothing for them. And the real problem comes when they decide, A, that that means that they shouldn't have sex with him because somehow this is immoral. And it's equated, it's so interesting, to non-consensual in today's climate. It's not non-consensual to not be in the mood for sex, which is basically biologically impossible for the majority of women within monogamy, as I'm describing, and to decide to try to have sex. This is not non-consensual. That is a decision that a woman is making. She's consenting, and I am encouraging her to initiate, in fact, a sexual encounter when she herself is not yearning deeply for sex. 
What is she yearning for in that moment? A uh, connection to see if the sex could actually be good after all, and maybe I'm right. The happiness on her husband's face, the rekindling of the romantic flame. I mean, she could have multiple desires there, but if none of them are for sex, that should not impede her from trying still to have sex and see if responsive desire works. Now, if you start, you're 10 minutes into it, and you're like, oh my God, this is horrible. Well, that probably indicates an issue. It indicates an issue with how you feel about your husband or with how you guys have sex or with the, how you're feeling about yourself, your body. There, there's a million reasons. But for some women, just very knowing that this is normal and this is how women operate and the majority of monogamous women never feel in the mood before they actually start to have sex with some once a month uh, changes of, of that, when you ovulate, then women can see their husband and say, I want to have sex. But that is basically your body saying, I want a baby. Even if your mind does not want a baby, very much doesn't, your body still does once a month for a few days. Then still, what we're saying is you can still have a fulfilling sex life, even if you didn't want to have sex that minute in the first place. So A, it's not, it's not non-consensual or forced to try to get in the mood to have sex with somebody that you love. And B, it doesn't mean anything about the relationship or the attraction. It is not better to have spontaneous arousal than to have responsive desire. That's not better. These things are not pitted against one another. When you are in a new relationship, you have spontaneous desire. Some women never do, actually. Some women always have responsive desire, even at the beginning. They never, literally never, if they're a lower libido person, have looked at their husband and said, I want to have sex with him, in their head, or out loud. But when they start to have sex with him from the very first time during dating or, or, or you know, during dating, I mean, some people wedding night, not you, most of my listeners, but still, from the very first time, they didn't feel spontaneous desire ever. They only feel responsive desire, and that's okay. But where what I'm talking about is the people that only, that, that think that spontaneous desire is the only thing that means that you are meant to be together, that you're sexually compatible, and that everything is right with the world. This is an impossible standard for the physiology of most human females. Now, in the post that I write about this topic, I give a little formula that may help women that feel kind of before they get in the mood. So remember, it takes you like, who knows? Let's say, let's say it takes you 10 minutes for your body to warm up and responsive desire to kick in. So during those 10 minutes, if the man is focused on the woman trying to be a good lover, trying to be do everything he's always been told, make the woman come first, right? So let's say he's like really, and let's say it's been a while since your last encounter. So the man is really trying to focus on the woman. He's excited. He's touching her everywhere. He wants to start going down on her quick. He wants to t take her shirt off, do all this stuff, right? A, I talked in the highly sensitive woman, making your highly sensitive wife want sex a lot more podcast and post. I discuss this, all of that stuff where it's like the clothes come off, the lights are on, and he's staring at you. This stuff can like really kill it for a highly sensitive woman. But even a regular woman, if she's not aroused yet, which we're kind of assuming is the default. Remember, this is, this is what is in most women is responsive desire. So we're assuming this is the default for your wife or for you, the wife, if you're listening to me. Um, if this is the default, so there's 10 minutes, right, let's say, of your sexual encounter during which you don't, like, feel that excited. So if he's focusing on you, it starts to feel kind of awkward. It's, like, weird. you got to act like you're into it, but you're not into it yet. So it's kind of, like, this feels disingenuous. It can really turn you off to the whole responsive desire, trying sex out thing. So what I say in my post, and which is a, for is a formula, at a time when the woman is relaxed, the man can start by being sweet, loving, saying nice things, giving a massage. That's really very useful. And then the encounter can switch to 
the man. So the woman can touch the man during this time that she is getting aroused. A lot of women are aroused by their male partner's arousal, but they never get to see it because the order of operations is always switched. So like he is working on her first. So she feels awkward. She's not turned on yet. And that's when everything is happening. Then he's so excited after that, that basically they have intercourse. He comes and they're done. This is not fun. It's not even fun for the man. A lot of the men that I talked to wish that encounters were longer. So if while the woman is still feeling like she herself is not physiologically aroused, meaning in a woman, by the way, you can't really touch her erogenous zones until she's aroused. So for most men, this is a fine pickle, right? You want to turn her on, but you can't turn her on. You can't touch her to turn her on until she's turned on. That sounds like a recipe for celibacy or some crazy gaslighting, neither of which is the case. So in what I suggest, the first stage of sex should be foreplay focused on the man so that the woman is touching and stroking the man. He's going to get more excited. As he gets excited, this she warms up. This takes up her 10 minutes. Then he can start to touch her erogenous zones to turn her on. And then they can really go to town with intercourse or whatever sort of um, orgasm inducing activity they do. So remember... Also, by the way, I mean, this could be subject for like 20 more podcasts, but this whole order of operations thing really gets messed up with a lot of people because they go just like one direction. So we do like a little bit of foreplay, then intercourse, then we're done. But why? By then the woman is, as you're learning, just getting warmed up. So why is it over? So you can always stop intercourse and go back to foreplay. You can do that as many times as you want to do. The more the better. You know, the encounter is supposed to last longer than this podcast or than a few of my podcasts strung together because they're only 20 minutes. So if you've been listening to this podcast while you're having a sexual encounter, I'm just kidding. Never do that. (laughs) That's not going to be an aphrodisiac. Don't listen to it during sex. But listen to it long before sex because it is very useful and it can help you guys figure out what you are going to do to make use of your newfound knowledge about responsive desire and ensure that the entire way that you conceive of whether your wife is attracted to you or you are attracted to your husband is not predicated on going against basic biology of a monogamous female. Okay, so this is super important and it is one of the ways that you guys can be on a team trying to enhance your sex life versus me against you, which is what I see a lot of things devolve into when it is lower libido versus higher libido and we're both in our corner and we're advocating for our position. No, the couple needs to be on the same side working on the sex life, both partners together and learning information that can help you understand why things are not going perfectly and come up with brainstorming solutions such as changing how you think about it as well as what you actually do in the encounter doing things like that can bring you closer not just in the bedroom but in every which way okay so I hope that you found this enlightening and that I left you with something to at least think about or try hopefully both and I will continue discussing responsive desire in the context of monogamy in later podcasts, although it won't be so central. But this is a primary uh, topic because it can really transform how you view what you think of as your attraction levels and your sex life in general. All right. And I will I will talk to you guys soon. Bye bye.